All right. So let's start. So today we're talking about diversification. Okay, and some methods for for this. Looking at this. All right. So, any, any questions about anything else so far before we go on? No. Nope. What? Did I bring pie? I could go pie. Uh, I like pie. Well, it's, it's, it's pie, but it's like 54% insect, so it's probably not a good pie. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, and pie diagrams are often bad ways to show stuff, too, so tough. Here's a pie diagram. <laughs> um, it shows the median organism is an insect based on the number of species. Right? So as you study something else, so wasting your time on these minor things, right? You should study insects. Okay? <coughs> um, so here's what we see in nature. Okay, it's like slightly old, you know, that's like 88, but you know, still we so we know more about all these groups, but still ballpark, lots of insects. Okay. I assume this is not including microbes. No. Um, they're not the right species. Um, yeah, and microbes the taxonomy is funny anyway, because they have horizontal gene transfer and various other things. But at least they have a name registry. So, why do we care about this? So, you're all biologists, right? Here's an observation about nature. Okay, so what? A lot of people spend their careers working on diversification questions. Right? So, yeah, so the most diversity is in insects. Okay. As biologists, why do we care about this sort of differential diversity? Or I said to you, you know, cichlids are 5% of all vertebrates are cichlids. Okay, sure. Right? Or here we have a case of, you know, if I think of angiosperms, I think of the phylogeny as amaryllis as everything else. Right, so this one species became two species. One species went on to become 250,000 species. One went on to become one species. Ooh. Right, so <coughs> as biologists, why is that of interest? Why did that one not exist? Right, so what's wrong with this one? Right, what pro I guess. <laughs> why hasn't it gone extinct? Right, so what sort of processes lead to this difference? Right? And as biologists, our role is to sort of understand the world as it is, right? And so the processes that lead to the current world. And that could be, you know, ecological processes, you know, why do I have this sort of trophic, trophic cascade? But also could be evolutionary processes, right? Why are there so many species of insects in the world and so few species of vertebrates? Okay? Um, <coughs> or even a few species of plants that insects eat. Okay? Um, and so diversification question methods are looking at understanding these processes. So understanding the patterns while trying to get out why we see these patterns. Okay. Um, <coughs> the only way to get these comparisons is by doing sister group comparisons. So what's a sister group? Right. So you have a group, and they have you know divergence. One half goes one way, one half goes the other way. They're each other's sister groups. Okay, and here we have a comparison of sister groups, and um, this kind, the ones on this one, this row column, have latex canals. Okay, this column doesn't have latex canals. Okay, why might that be of interest here? Yep, so this has been attacked by, by many herbivores. Right. Um, and so you can look at the comparison of the number of species. This one has canals, has one species. Its sister group has either, six, has either 60 or 6 species. Right, so they're not sure about the phylogeny, and that's one of those. Okay. So then, you know, not having latex canals makes you more diverse. Okay. This one, the tail is, or the witch. 
conifers and there's a ginkgo. One ginkgo. Um, so it's under conifers, but I'm interested in conifers and so forth. Okay? And so with all these tests, and only the first one's negative. Okay? So what can you conclude from that? What's the effect of latex canals on diversity? Generally increases, right. And we can do a sign test and find it significant. Okay? So now you start to understand something about what causes diversity, right? So it seems in this case that being protected against herbivores causes an increase in diversity. Okay? Because these start at the same point, and then one got latex canals and one lost them. What the root state was, and then diversified after that, right? And everything else is the same. It's doing twin study, right? We have twin, two twins born, and you give this one cigarettes and beer and whatever else he wants. This one you don't. You say, okay, who lives longer? Who's happier? Right? Do this comparison <coughs> and see, you know, and do this. So you can just own how many twin pairs. And so each twin pair might have their own inherited diseases and you know other environmental factors or genetic factors. But each one serves the control from the other. Yeah? Isn't it more like a correlation instead of causation? In that sense, I mean, we could have just lost all the other species because they were not protected. So they got, went extinct, so we just see these few. But we right. might have had uh, also like a few thousand of them. At least on that side. But they died out. Yeah, but that just that doesn't mean that they didn't diversify. Yeah, it does. So they diverged and then they died. So what we care about here, so good. So what we care about here is net diversification. Okay. Yeah. So other questions do relate to that that path of how they increase or decrease. So like trilobites, we have no. Yeah. Yeah. So you're actually asking two questions. One is about the missing stuff, and you're right. And so sometimes it's of note to look at, you know, these trends of trilobites. Say, when do they become diverse? How does the Permian extinction affect them? Okay, now they're all gone. Um, the other good thing is causation and correlation, right? So we have this correlation here, right? And so it could, right? And so these many comparisons, and it seems that, you know, having latex canals leads to more diversity, just like smoking leads to less lifespan, right? But it's still just co it's correlation. Yeah. We can't evolve latex canals in something. Yeah. Other questions? Here another example. Okay. And here's a group of beetles. Okay. And some of them feed on um, plants, and others don't. Others are carnivores or scuzzivores, eating, eating fungus, detritus, and things like that. Okay. And <coughs> doing a comparison here. Here are the two comparisons. Right. And those are insects. Lots of nice numbers here. Right. So 85 versus 44,000. <coughs> 30 versus 150, and so based on this, there's five positive comparisons. So there's just enough to squeak out a 0.05 for p-value, or a little slightly less than 0.05 for p-value under a sign test, and so yeah, it's significant. It's a science paper, right? Um, <coughs> so beetles are diverse because they eat plants. Okay, there's the conclusion here. Right? Again, it's a correlation, not a causation. Okay, we need to see how these history comparisons can be used. All right, questions about this? Yeah. Is there any way to read chromosomes in correlation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, what do you mean here in the sense of the more diverse groups happen to have this thing that happens? They have more. I don't think you can. Um, can we think of a way? You have to control for all the confounding factors. Right, so. Which is possibly impossible. Which is probably impossible here. Yeah, so all confounding factors like slightly different genomes and where they live and when rocks fell from the sky. And, yeah. You might be able to set up some sort of simulation. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean, you could simulate where you say you know everything, but then it shows you what, what your simulation says, not what, what the true, true process is. Yeah. I don't see it still affecting theory, though. Like, correlation is still very strong in relationships just between having correlated effects and many taxons, but always it's coming back to some other theory that you're building up your model. Yeah. Yeah, the fact that you're there correlates with an image I see in my brain, right? It's not like causing it. It can't prove it causes it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you can go crazy going that down that path. Um, but it's good to think about, I mean, because sometimes we do have these issues where, okay, we think it's latex canals that's that, is it, but it actually could be something else. Maybe it's something about um, only if you live in an area that's humid enough to have lots of extra fluid. Do you, are you able to have latex canals unless it's actually being in a humid area that causes diversification rather than latex canals per se? So there could be issues like that. Um, and one, one thing is a lot of these area things are only done with univariate. So you could say, okay, is it latex canals or is it humidity? Well, you can only do one or the other in most methods. And working methods where you can do more of them. Um, so like that talk that was here on Monday. So one of the research projects he's working on, we're looking at ways where you can um, have multiple characters affecting it. So you can say, okay, this character matters more than this character. And this character is just being dragged along by this other character. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, this was, this, this was comparisons are nice because, you know, they're the same thing until they speciate. There is a slight wrinkle in that um, if I have these two clades, well, it could be that I don't, I don't get this whatever focal trait is until later, right? And so is it so I had all, I had all this time where I haven't had that? It could be something like that. Um, How much would that affect the results? It wouldn't really affect the results much, except unless you were doing something where you said, What's their diversification rate with this trait versus not that trait? So do you use this time, or do you use this time, or do you use this time? Right? They're based on when the trait, first of all, we don't know what that is probably. Is it based on the stem group age or the crown group age? So is that sort of issue. People make sense, understand that? Alright. <coughs> so now you can look at diversification rates is using this equation. What's this equation? Exponential growth. Exponential growth. Yes. Why is it relevant here? These aren't, these aren't only bacteria, right? So it's not just. No, I mean, if you imagine each species is an individual, the distribution would be like this reduction. So it would, it would take it theoretically Mm -hmm. Right. So in terms of growth, each individual has its own birth rate, right? And so if you have more individuals, you have a f more and more being born, you have this exponential growth. Okay. Um, what are the assumptions of that model? Is it surviving? Nope. Everything so you get an exponential growth in a population where you know, the birth rate is 3 and the death rate is 1.1. Still exponential growth. Does that count in splitting? Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, the model does have that kind of splitting. I don't think you technically would need that for exponential growth. But, but, in general, you assume that kind of splitting. the same rate? All right, so the rate, this B rate is constant through time. Yep. No. Yeah, you get everything happening just in, you know, eastern Tennessee or the whole world doesn't matter for this. Yeah. Well, it assumes you can keep going forever. 
right? Like you said, so you know you could have go up to we have a million species or ten million species. Assume you can go up to any number before, we, you know, right? So that's that. Um, it assumes lineages are independent. It assumes there's no wait time between speciation events. So it could be you can only speciate every million years, and it's yourself to somehow recover from speciation. It doesn't have that. Okay. We're running assumptions with this model. Number of species. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting because with with these overall approaches, we think it's we just care about species as objects themselves. Um, but if you think about this sort of ecologically, if I have you know five million bison in the Great Plains, I could have those as one species of bison. Okay, those as five species of bison, right? Same number of individuals, different number of species. And here, we, all we care about is the number of species. We're ignoring that individual part. Okay, so it's still something to reconcile is bringing those two ideas together. No one has yet. Okay. Other questions about this? Okay. <coughs> so here we have Hawaiian silver swords, which are cool for plants. Um, <coughs> and so from a phylogeny, you can look at my phylogeny. I can say, okay, at this time point, I have one, two, three, four, five species, and that's at this height. Now at this time point, I have one, two, three, four, five species at that point, okay? At this time point, I have one, two, three, four species, okay? And I can put it on a plot like this, right? Log number of species, age since origin, okay? What do you expect on exponential growth? Right, because that's the log scale, right? So it's like a constant line. Okay. Does it look like a constant line? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, good enough for biology. Yeah. <coughs> I have a quick question. I'd like yeah. to ask if um, the word beam in this one is kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. And so you can take our equation and Plug and chug, right? And fit a line, right? And on that line, B is the slope, okay? And the starting number of species is two, all right? So you get age from crown group age, so when the group first diversifies, okay? Um, so you have this, and so. <coughs> yep. So but the cool thing is I can. For you know, I can put it into this basic, very basic equation, right, and get an estimate of diversification rate, right. So I can take this value, plug in here, this value I know, this value I know, t, right, and I can solve for b. Okay. Right. So you go back to exponential growth, right? It's n at times t is n at times zero, times e to the rt or bt here, right? But what's n at zero? For growth, straight which is within the crown group. Two. All right, so that's two individuals, two pieces. So you can put so we can plug two in there. Make sense? All right, so now I can go and just from knowing how many species I have at a given point and how deep the tree is, I can get estimate of net diversification rate. Okay. So let's do so. <coughs> so here's a case where, so said by Mike Young and Sanderson, okay. they took a bunch of plant groups. And count up the number of species in them. Okay. Figure out their age. Okay. And then use this equation to figure out the group diversification rate. Okay. This CG versus SG is crown group versus stem group. Alright, so 
we have a you know a state of interest that connects to figure tree. Okay, here is the crown group. This is the stem. Um, why might you only know one or the other? So, for example, if I have, if I know that I found the first feather 116 years ago, right? I know that birds must have connected with the, anything with the feathers of birds. Let's make that assumption, right? <coughs> then I know the stem group of birds is at least that old. Right? It could be the modern birds are descended from one ecosystem that was 10 million years ago, and it must not be stem. Right? That I guess is the stem age. Okay? Whereas if I have <coughs> Phylogeny, and I have spanned the entire group, so I can span from Amborella up to any other angiosperm, right? Then I can figure out the crown group age. Okay, and then they can estimate these rates. So that's the instruments as a whole, uh, this and that multiplication rate. Um, you know, which you might know, like water lilies have much lower water concentration rates. Okay. Any questions about that? So I said to you, estimate the diversification rate for beetles. Gave you the diversity and age. You could do it. Yes. So here they've plotted age for various, for various groups. Okay. So we have age of the clade and the number of species. Right. And we can look at sort of these are groups that are sort of mean verification rate. And then these have a higher rate than you expect, and these have a lower rate than you expect. Based on the other group, other individuals in that group. Okay. So it's now in school. You can look and find, <coughs> you know, the steroids have a very fast verification rate. Okay. Whereas the water lilies are slow. Okay. Is this taking into account the age? So this no, this is the absolute age. Um, how could what, how could you want to do, do generation time instead? Or do you how do you, how do you change this? Right, and we go back to this thing, but right? instead of age sense, we do generation sense, and then B would be speciation per generations. Yeah. Why do you ask? Because if something gets you know, five generations per year, that's the time that you should be used. So it's not actually the same. Okay. So that's interesting. So what? So one big question in biology with all this is what sets these rates, right? And so it could be external factors, right? So what's one way to think speciate? What's the most common way to think speciate? Mostly, mostly no, most yeah, right. So you know isolation, right? Allopatry, different country, right? So you're a happy species living on its own. And then a mountain range pops up in between, in the middle of your range, and then you can't reproduce across the mountain range. Right? And over time, you evolve incompatibility so that if you do come back together, you can't interbreed anymore. That's so that's allopatric speciation. That's how I think most speciation happens. Probably not all, but most. Okay. <coughs> how, generation, how does generation time affect that? Why, why, so, and what, the thing that sets the, the speed is the speed at which things are subdivided. In that thing, right? So it's more like 
the speed of mountain formation is what sets the speciation rate rather than generation time. Right? Right. Or if I mean, if it were such that you come back together, and if you were coming back together after a million generations, you don't interbreed. If it's a thousand generations, you you could still interbreed. Right. So it could have some effect, but not as much big effect as just the frequency at which the mountain ranges appear. Whereas if speciation is based on, say, adaptive factors, right, um, and you have sexual selection driving things, then maybe faster speech, faster generation times lead to faster evolution of the barriers from sexual selection. So maybe that could affect it. There has been work on the effect of like roads on work of isolation, oh, on like lack of gene flow in like snails. And so I found that you know, actually a road does cause like a huge barrier for snails and across the road successfully. So there has been stuff like that. Whether it's led to actually speciation, I don't think it's been fast enough. But it's been, been long enough for that to happen yet. Um, do we go, 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 go find some really old like Roman road and see if there's you can speed some side of the road. That'd be awesome. So that's a, that's a research project. And I guess the cards aren't going that fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. chariots of fire or some blood snails. Yeah. Right, so you could say, you know, the Earth looks a lot bigger to a beetle than to a wildebeest, and so it's easier to have allopatry. So that would be something you could test. Does the small size lead to, lead to more speciation? Um, actually, not sure. Because there's also the issue of higher extinction risk, too, then, possibly. Because um, you're in a smaller area of the world, and so if something bad happens in that area, you're in trouble. And then the population size might be bigger. And so you can better adapt, do a selection, you don't have to have allele effects. Yeah. Good questions. And so we'll talk in a little bit about how you can actually estimate that. And one thing you do already with this thing is say, do the ones down here tend to have longer generation times than the ones up here? What are the ones down here? Are they smaller than the ones up here? So thinking of it that way. Actually, there's a way to explicitly test that, which we'll get to. Good. You're thinking well. That's um, about time. <laughs> what what else? What questions about this? If I took out the lines, do you still see a trend? You know, I've not seen those lines. If I did, I'd say it was just being pulled by your two upper rights. Yeah. And as we'll talk about at the end, the people, people are now looking at these sort of plots and saying, we're not seeing a whole lot of correlation between number of species and age of a clade. What's going on with that? There's nothing really um, to make it obvious to have distinguished it from high and like medium. Mm -hmm. Um, what sort of human biases could lead to problems with this sort of plot? 
So what we, species? Yes, what we call species, right? The species count. Good. And I mean, that's hard. So in many groups, we don't do a good job with identifying species. You can look at those like, you know, accumulation curves of, you know, how much effort versus how many species you get. And for many groups, it's still linear. Right? So you go, every time you go out, you get more, you get more species, right? Whereas if you go and get humans, you get the same species back, right? So, yeah. Okay. What else? Right, so this holds a fossil record, so our ages that we use on this axis are actually uncertain. And, you know, for angiosperms, we don't study, some studies have said the crab group age is 160, some say the age is 240 million years. It's a big difference. Right? Um, so let's go back to our dating stuff, right, clocking trees. A lot of uncertainty here. And that can dramatically affect your estimate of the rate. Could be, I mean, we, so there's, you know, the fossil record is clumped in terms of when things are fossilized. And so some things as human, human mass extinctions are actually mass losses of the evolution because we can find fossils. We can't detect anything after that point because no, no records. What else? We're not seeing here. That was some of the weird sampling plays. I think here they try to be exhaustive, like all the plant families, but it happen. But also, what do we name as clades? Right? So, you know, um, this plus this is also a clade. We don't have that on, the, on this plot. We have just those digital name groups. And so there could be biases in which groups people name. But it could be such that really name things that have a long stem, but all the times they have cool traits evolve, and then fast replication after that, so that way it's a thing that you can recognize, right? Whereas if it were something like this, right, we might not call this a group or this a group. And it's wait until he has this sort of long fuse and then diversity to actually name it something. And if that's the case, then that would cause a bias here. So something that people willing to study. No, because again, what's the, so the families are all independent groups. Well, they're not independent, but they are non-overlapping groups, right? So if this is a plant family, and I have some other thing that I call a plant family, you know that the species in here aren't in here, right? But I could have also named this as a plant family instead. So is that issue, is that bias? Yeah. And you know, one further problem here is that, you know, we have nephales, also we have angiosperms, and phyllis are within angiosperms, so the same taxes are plotted twice. There was a big fight in um, Anolis lizards. So, you know, these geckos, like the trunk crown, tree crown, all the, the, the losos stuff, right? It's a very cool, very cool system. Um, and the paper came, came out that said rather than one, one genus, we sh there should be eight genera. Like, ah, no. And there's no criterion for, you know. So we, right now we've all sort of agreed that you should only name clades, right? So. But as long as they're all clades, there's rules for where the names go. So like, which of those eight clades gets the name Anolis after we split the whole thing from Anolis? That's where the type specimen goes. So there's rules for that. But in terms of the taxonomy, there's no way to say, let me do a test to see if you're wrong. Right? There's no p-value on this.
So how can yeah. you really estimate the precipitation rates if you put in the year? We'll go thank. Oh, yeah. So, so there's the, there's actually terms for the splitters versus lumpers. Yeah. Yeah. And so splitters like to erect like you know eight genera, where lumpers like to like erect one genus. And the thing with taxonomy is those are both valid and such that like so now a nolus is both one of those eight and also all eight together. And depending which taxonomy you follow, you can use either one. And you can't say nope, we've revised it now. This one's the right one. Both persist in the literature until one dies out, which is kind of horrifying as a way of organizing things. Yeah. So it's, taxonomy is interesting. We actually might have a lecture about taxonomy or a small lecture about taxonomy if people, if people are interested in it, um, because it matters. Because like for this, you know, knowing how many species there are can matter, and at the species level. There's a little more hope because if people have a definition of what species is, like a non interbreeding group, so the group that doesn't interbreed with any other any other groups, right? So it's sort of like a biological species concept, then you can estimate are you interbreeding with this other group, right? Let's measure your actual gene flow. Up oh, gene flow is zero, okay, you're different species. Um, so or gene flow is rampant through the same species, right? So there's in theory ways to get at that. But a genus, you know, what's a genus? It's a group of species. It could be a group of one species. Homo. Yay. Right? Um, <coughs> so there's no way to actually test for that. There are so many ways to find genes. Yeah. And I feel like they are, they are all tied. And so there are groups that follow one definition, groups that follow another definition, but you can actually not compare the groups. So, yeah, Coin and Orr have a book on speciation where they have a table. That lists, I think it's like 20 different species concepts. People are advanced, like the genealogical species concept, phylogenetic species concept, um, biological species concept, coherence species concept. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. Most ta actual taxonomists, if you ask them what they're doing, they'll say biological species concept, which is about act th things that are species that uh, things that are not species that they're actually and potentially not interbreeding with other species. Right, so if you can't interbreed now and won't interbreed in the future, then you're a different species. So the often wolf are actually one species? Yes. Yeah, this, this fuzziness, yes. So, I mean, I, and, and I, have, I actually have another example right now, but I know there are, like, if I compare like dogs, then you have like all these different kinds of dogs, but they're uh, considered as one species. Mm -hmm. But if you do the same, there are plants that show like similarity, but they're, then they're a couple Species. Yep. That's kind of weird. So I don't know. Yeah. What? Right. Yeah. 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 There's all sorts of messiness like that. I mean, lions and tigers will interbreed, right? So they want species. Yeah. Or tigons, depending on the parentage. Yeah, that's what it's. it's, it's yeah. Right. So the great Malawi yeah, cyclic. Species, so all species. It's all one species. It's just, you're just overselling it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Like, when we talk about how fast their diversification rate is versus other systems, and it's all well, out of just based on the whole thing. On the other hand, I mean, you know, I know I'm a different species from an oak tree, right? No matter how beautiful it is, we're not going to have viable offspring, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> There are these distinctions, right? And so, yes, it gets fuzzy in certain parts, right? But still, I mean, there is some distinction where you're not going to interbreed anymore, right? And so, you know, there's no way you can merge the insects into 5,000 species like we have of vertebrate, of, like we have of mammals, right? So there's definitely way more insect species than mammal species, right? But, it, it, you know, but are there 5,000 mammal species or 4,500 mammal species? We can fight to the death over that, and people do. Just like the names of 
And we think about doing, do, I mean, but, I mean, so naming m matters for, you know, ecology, right? So if you want to go out in nature and say, okay, this oak tree has this um, climate tolerance, right? Well, which, which, what group of plants is that oak tree? And so if, I, if I'm a lumper, then I have this wide-ranging species that has this wide climate tolerance. If I'm a splitter, I have these, you know, specific ones. There's a... Uh... In terms of conservation, too, I mean, is this little bird that's on this coastline one, a different species or just some variety you can wipe out? So you can now do things like estimate um, how much gene flow there is, right? So there's three migrants per generation. Okay, so now you know a better way to estimate it, but then you still have this fuzzy boundary. So Endangered Species Act in the States is like evolutionarily significant units, I think. And so, you know, is this salmon run different from this other salmon run? By some sort of agreement by scientists. Yeah, DNA barcoding and stuff. And it could be, I mean, it could, it could be different species, which just have a huge pop effective population size. They've, uh, they've, they've looked, like, around, I'm not really sure what, whether or not it's more than one, but Yeah. There's a case of a, of a butterfly species that they did barcoding on and found that it was, like, really, it looked really diverse. And they looked, and it was clumped by host plants. So what they thought was one generalist species was actually 11 specialists. So you can do stuff like that. Uh, you, uh, I mean, you guys seem really into this. We can we can do a, we can do a talk about about I, this. Yeah. I, I read a study which is not about uh, epigenetic, but epigenetic, where they had two populations. Uh -huh. There were distinct populations with no interbreeding. Yeah. And they were genetically ident identical, but they found a, a ton of variation on the epigenetic level. And if you misplaced them, they couldn't survive. Oh, cool. And so, um, but they they're still considered the same species, and but they were considered. They were genetically identical. That's neat. I don't think so. I kind of See, that's why you have the core course. So you'll care about that. Like, oh, wow, those are cichlids. Or, uh, uh, <laughs> tax on five. Mammals. <laughs> yeah, well, mammals are they're all small group, doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's that approach. Um, <coughs> another approach is to look at what's happening in a group over time. So, like the, the trial of that example, right? Um, <coughs> that's looking at start and the things along that path. What would that tell you? Why would you care about that? True. So if you had the tree that had, you know, these one that did survive, you can include that information. Good. 
we actually still did do this kind of approach, which we call lineage through time approach, when we have only surviving species too. Just like in that first question. What else could I tell you? Thank you. What do you mean? Um, like what I was mentioning earlier, uh, the, the the diversification we have prior to the last species. Mm -hmm. So since we probably don't get all of the last species, the lower bound. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 We get that. There's also an issue um, when dealing with just modern stuff of ascertainment bias. So if you want to know what that is, yeah. ascertainment bias. So um, a good example of that is, so basically in this context, it's you only see the trees. So let's assume we have equal birth and death rate, right? So every change you species, you have equal to dying off. Well, the trees you find at the end are those where birth happened to be greater than death, right? And it never once bumped into zero, it like hit zero. And so there's this biased sample of those that happen to survive. So you have to account for this bias when you're looking at this stuff. So another example of that is, you know, do, do dolphins save drowning sailors, right? So you have boats sinking, you have dolphins. We know dolphins like to push objects for fun, right? So one possibility is that dolphins just push people around, and then those they push to shore survive and say, the dolphins saved me. And those they, those they push out to sea don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so you get this biased sample which will say, oh, you know, all these sailors say, oh, the dolphins saved me. You don't see the other half that went extinct, right? Um, it would die off this <laughs> and so, or, or it could be the dolphins are actually always pushing people to shore, right? So it's hard to tell it apart because of the strong ascertainment bias. And so, when dealing with these sort of approaches, you have to take that into account. Okay. That said, a lot of the programs actually, if you look inside, don't take that into account well. And so you get these great estimates and some of the crap fix. But in general, as users, you think about what this bias might be. And so this bias is greatest if you have a situation where you have high birth and death rates, right? Where you're moving around a lot and you hit zero. If you have just birth and no death, then there's no ascertainment bias at all. Okay. So now that you can tell, so look, imagine I drew a tree. Tell you about it. What's the, what's the version of this one? Yeah, so here's like a period here with lots of speciation events, and then not much after that. If you look at the linear time plot, the log scale, I have you know, this, right, and then rapid increase, and then this is up. Right. And so if you can do a linear time plot, you can find out, oh look, there's this big increase here. Right? So this way of summarizing this to actually estimate change in the population of the What? No. Well, when you draw it. Okay. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Okay. So, like, you're talking about the area for all that. So, like, this know. area? Yeah. Okay. What's your x axis here? I'm just saying it's just the same time and you're going to be able to do Okay, so we, have, so, we, right, so, we, so we have times this way. You know, so, you just want to do, like, number of ranges or just, like, so x is just number of lineages? Sure. Okay. For 
Well, no, I mean the body number, just like that. Okay, I'll call it like this. Okay. I'm just wondering if anybody. So, but, so, I'm just not quite sure what you're, what you're saying about this. So, what, could that tell you something about. I'm just thinking like different. So, then one thing you could do is you could look at these lengths, at these segments. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. I'm talking about yeah. adding those together, and then I don't know what the top one would be, but like comparing area for, say, the same amounts of, like, so you have you know, three over there on the right, and three uh, tips on the right, four on the left. Mm -hmm. and then the difference in area per amount of tips or something like that. I don't know what you're trying to do to me. Yeah. Like geographic area, or just so not geographic area, more like fitness measures. Yeah. Like so like like so like what do you mean by area, though? So, so area, like on the board, you can do. You can just use So another way of thinking of that area is just amount of time with different amounts of memory use. Right. Okay, so here I have. So it's, so it's actually the same as this, where like so this area corresponds to the area here where I have from this point to this point. Right. So we actually put it here. That's the end. From this point to this point I have three taps up. Yeah. And then back here. This amount of time, two taps. So. It might just be where you want to do that. That's what's good is this. I mean, a lot of the stuff is actually describing in front of it. So it's probably just going to be here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what to get at here, but it's worth playing with that more. Mm -hmm. And one thing you can do is look at these, and this is what this is sort of doing. Look at these branch lengths, these end lengths. Okay. What is this end but what's, what's the edge length? So, right. what, what determines how long that is? No, we were talking about time straight. Time scale. Right? Right? So, if I have a lower speciation rate, I'll have much long, long, longer edge. Right? Same way they have, you know, a frozen bulb versus an incandescent bulb. The time between the frozen bulb breaks is a lot shorter for <laughs> and so you can use, you know, these branch lengths at each other time to tell you something about how quickly your your first time at that point. Is this pretty basic summary by this? Okay. Yeah. 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 Another thing you can do with these methods is actually start to estimate birth and death rates. Okay, so before we we're estimating sort of net birth rate. So we're assuming that there's no no extinction, right? But there is extinction. No extinction. Extinction of entire species, but not save the but not save the whole clade. So a flower species goes extinct, but angiosperms still survive. Sorry, yeah. So again, I'm think, we're think, when we talk about this, we often think about like species as like individuals, and so they're born and they die. So birth rate, death rate, yeah. And the fact that one species goes from two individuals to a billion, we don't care about that, as long as it's not zero. Yeah. Again, it'd be interesting to kind of merge together. <coughs> and so you can use, if you had a pure birth process, right, you'd expect um, to straight line. But with birth and death, you have a little bit of bias where at the very end, you don't have enough time for any death. So are you estimating the instantaneous rate right at the end is your birth rate? Right, so you have your net rate, so the slope, birth minus death. At the end, the tangent can be birth. Okay, and so then if you know birth minus death and birth, you can estimate death. Okay. <coughs> yes, 
Citizens Plus can give you an estimate of birth rate and death rate, as well as net, tr net diversification rate. Why do we care about all three of those? Okay, sure. Um, let me actually show you this list. This might be easier. Okay. Here I have simulations of different phylogenies, and from that I've extracted the lineage to time plots. Okay. There's tons of number of species in each point in time of this is surviving species. Okay. And <coughs> so they, they never go down. Okay. Here I have a birth rate of 0.1 and a death rate of 0. So I keep increasing at some point I get up to 100 species. Here, same thing. Okay. And I start simulating until you get the pieces. And this one tells you how long it takes to get there. And so these are very different ways for things to evolve. Right? How are they different? What, what processes are different? Well, with blue, blue you start earlier, actually. Okay. It, takes, it takes longer. Right. Blue takes longer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, it's looking at coalescence earlier today, so. Uh, it's, it's hard. Yeah. And the, your trees are upside down. Yeah. And, the trees are upside down. Yeah. Um, so, like, the red and blue points are two different sizes. Suppose I'm going to ask you first. So, the cool thing about this is the net diversification rate is the same. So your net rate is birth minus death. Right? But here the turnover rate, birth plus death, is higher. Okay. And you also hear with the red one, you have ascertainment bias. Right? Because what I'm not showing you is those that died out before they came to 100 species. Right? So if you've gone all the way to 99 and then died off, right? and then you don't see that. So then so you see the ones that get up to 100 and then you bring a sample at that point. Oh, that's why it's not a simulation. Yeah. So, um, they do. Because at the present, they have new species. So when you do a simulation like this, so let's so say I have a, a birth death process. I want to let it start running. Okay. When does it stop? And so you could let it stop after a certain population size, put in here, or you can let it stop after a certain time period. So after 10 million years, stop. And then it stay up. Because I count and counting time back from when you hit 100 species. I can count the time instead from where you start, right? And then all of them start off at the same point. And hit 100 at different times. Does that make sense? I did it this way because you're So right, so here we have very different processes about birth and death. <coughs> so the same net diversification rate. Okay. Um, so the turnover is bigger than both here. And you see the difference in different times. And so you can also see sort of how this sort of tables up here, right? And so you can imagine if you do the same thing right there, you get the birth rate of one, get the birth rate of point one. Okay. And that's what these Lineage time plot to give you. Okay. Um, birth rates are hard to estimate, and actually death rates are really hard to estimate. Um, we've seen a paper published saying you should not estimate them at all um, because there's any sort of weirdness in like the, the rate's not completely constant through time. You have a dramatic effect on the estimate of, of death rates. And here's the plot looking at payment bias for these simulations. These are the red ones. Okay. Um, <coughs> and here 
is I'm calling death rate here. And death rate is birth rate um, minus 0.1. Right? So same net reservation rate for each one. Simulation. So I'm seeing how often do I have them go to the exit. Um, at birth, we have no death, zero. There's a moderate amount of death. So that means you're definitely seeing a biased sample of the sailors pushed to shore. Okay. And here you can see various lineage time plots. Right? So, um, uncle birth death, right? It's like this. Um, very low D. We have high D, we have this upturn. Right? We have just D up here, and D minus D down here. Okay? And you have other things too. So here we have one rate, birth minus death, and then at the point, a different rate. Okay? What could that mean? Um, so, so it's a good thing. So, how does the number of offspring affect the number of species? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It could be a change in birth rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your extinction rate goes up relative? Yep. So like can adaptive radiation make you slow down? Slow down? Yeah. And they call that this, right? But this versus this, good luck being able to detect the difference. Yeah. I mean frankly, this versus this, good luck. Yeah. Right. So if this were the case we'd have some sort of Then we have a mass extinction. Okay. And if you didn't, you know, because I don't believe you, right? It's always a good thing to say. How could you test that this is actually the case? No. Because there could be other factors happening there too. So it could be after mass extinction, you also have a rapid rate afterwards or something like that. Some various biological so complexities. This is this is a this is a this, these are, sorry these are theoretical predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Right. So just do a simulation under this condition and see if we get the effect. So why don't we start off with the uh, see what it looks like like if you put a neutral line back there? How does that constant? So, um, it's a constant. So, anti sigmoid is a description of the curve shape. It's a constant sigmoid curve. I guess the reverse of that. So, that's why you have. That's all the anti sigmoid means in that case. Oh, yeah, no, that's, that's not what I was. Okay. Um, why, why do you. Before, before you angle on that, why does it. This is a constant, but it doesn't have the same shape as a little constant. Um, I think it comes from the strange sampling of mass extinction. But I'm actually not sure. Yeah. Um, and then, so, the quiz is text is what you get. So, again, my intuition on that is failing. Yeah, I noticed that before. See, by teaching you, you learn so many things. Right, let's take a five minute break. Was it, what, are there more questions about this before we break? All right, let's break and come back in five minutes.
For orange, you'd be on it. So, you know, on Earth here. Well, it'd be like an orange track suit every day. And then, and then any branch of that thing you want to go, just create a bunch of them that occurs. You just put yeah. it that way. At least that's, that's, cool. that's, that's how Grimaldi and Eagle argue for it. They're entomologists, and we're just like, this, we're not going to teach you. So when I took entomology, it's their text. And they're like, we're not going to teach you. You won't know any species, genera, or family names at the end of this class. You'll just know what the entomology is. And so our final exam was, you know, this all new pseudomorphic states below our proposal. What conclusions can you draw from that? All right, so any questions about this so far? So what's this good for? Right. What? <laughs> That's a question I was just going to ask you. Yeah. yeah. This whole diversification thing, I don't know. OK. I'm not sold. I mean, the, the theory can make sense, but the data is so crappy that I feel like we shouldn't touch that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's so many words. That's true. Yeah. Oh well. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> like since we can't like specifically with this figure, it's like we can't since there are now good papers suggesting that we shouldn't estimate this. You shouldn't estimate death rate, but you might estimate, you know, which model fits best. Right? And that's more robust.
between that one. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, okay. So, KT extinction, right? What could you ask about the, that? So, what, what sort of you know questions about diversification could that lead to? Well, you we could say, okay, do we have a massive radiation of mammals after the KT, right? Or mammals being kept down by non-avian dinosaurs and then they could you know go mad and diversify, right? Well, that is this model, right? So you can fit and find this model is much better than this model and that this point is at the KT, you can say, oh, okay, yes, we're right. That's how, that's how things diversify. They fill empty niches. Okay? Um, <coughs> if you find this, you say, okay, well, things are diversifying independent of what else is going on around them. Okay, so big rocks around us, but they don't have diversification, right? And so you can get at questions like that. Yeah, but even that is biased on the species which is soon. Right. So, I mean, that was actually what was, what was my, what my major problem that we, that the, the norm in the species we have, and like, right. when we don't know if these are actually real species, uh, and so we kind of really compare, compare different plays and all this stuff, and that kind of messes up the, uh, all right, so, all the results. We think this tree. Right? Um, people might disagree and call this one species, and this one species, and maybe this one species. Right? So you can go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 species to 7 species. Right? It's, it's a pretty big difference. We can even do it, let's call this and this. Right? It's 10 to 5. It's a huge range. Right? How does it affect the linear through time plot? How would that affect the linear through time plot for this? So, let's make it. So, um, we'd have the same plot. Like that, right? And we go from that to this should be overlapping if you get drawn properly. That. Right. Yep. Is it cool if you can use these to look at what's going to happen with climate change and how that's going to affect different species? And it's like because of this end bit, <coughs> I don't know that we can present a lot. So, I mean, we're we'll probably mess up the uh, the diversification rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so, even if it looks nice in the beginning. What? Even if it looks like it's beginning. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it's beginning. beginning. Yeah. So it looks like it has been, it's, it's not a big effect, but it totally messed up with that diversification rate. Right. Yeah, so at the end, would it even go up to, yeah. Uh, this is cool. Right, at the end, there's this big jump. So there is noise there, um, but as you'll find from contact with data, there's always noise. So, for example, I was doing a study of gene evolution which with, Mike, with Mike Gilchrist, where you know genes are beautiful and perfect, but what a part of one of the parameters is expression level, right? And we found there's actually no correlation with expression level because expression level is measured so poorly in data that I'm trying to fit it to the model, and <coughs> there's you know this this, this cloud. Yeah, I know. You have models to take those into account. No, you don't. Yeah, I mean, so in our case, we didn't. I mean, so yes, there's noise in the data, but what you should do is figure out how much the noise affects your signal. And it could be, you know, in this case, if our question is this versus this, 
the noise of the chip wouldn't affect that. Right? If our question is overall net diversification rate, it could. Okay? Same way if we, if we care about looking at adapt, you know, evolution of amino acids, maybe our estimates of expression level being bad affect it a lot, maybe they don't. Um, <coughs> but it's premature to throw away a field because there's uncertainty at the tips. So you can use it for, <coughs> well, so just this linear through time stuff, so ignoring the character stuff we're going to get to in a minute, it can tell you stuff about the changing in rate over the tree or between groups, right? So do, does a NOLA have a faster diversification rate than water lilies? Right, so you can get at that information. And if you find that, you know, Anolis is this, and water lilies are this. Like, yes, number of species is a huge uncertainty. Right? The rates never overlap. How do you know that water lilies can't So, very different than they did when the speciation was adapted. Right? Yeah, so very different than they did when the speciation was adapted. So they could have, since they're so well adapted, they don't need to teach you more. Right? And so coelacans is only two or three kinds of coelacans that they can even talk to the fish. And they can either bring them in or bring them away. But it could, I mean, but we often think that speciation happens. And the process that lead to lack of water in the species. Did Ben talk to you about what gens give you more probabilities as well? So, one question is um, when you have a you know, mountain pop up or you, or you have some of the in Ohio and you think that that's going to do it, why do you evolve a mountain in the So, one possibility is. Uh, it, it's better for me to have a um, cold weather phenotype here and warm weather phenotype there. We can have selection of gifts and home gifts. Maybe it's adapted to have um, lots of people that can go in this way. Okay. <coughs> it could be random too. And the question is if, if at first there's no um, cost, it could be random. So how do you get the evolution of And so, the gens give a lot of compatibilities are a way of explaining this. Isn't that how it costs everything? You put, you put four things We're going to get to that at the end. We're going to do a little test of that and find out why you might why you might build this kind of breeding. But imagine for this case we have something like Drosophila, where we have probably a probably a um, decrease. Right? So um, the way we're going to be adapted to not be breeding. So let me like, introduce you to the again. Back in the old way. Right? Why else would you have this? Because you think that I'm trying to get a mate, and I can only make it half a little my meat needs out of all the women. I need to do less well than someone who can make a mate out of the women. Okay? Um, and so, you know, if you think about, you know, if a couple of them starts off AA, right, and BB, say, okay, now I find out later I have, you know, AA, you know, can't interbreed with BB. How do you get a to evolve? Right? Because you go to this intermediate where these can make with anything, and these are rare in the population, can make with very little, very few things. Right? And so 
this idea of WN screen motor compatibilities such that I can start off here with AA BB, and here I can go to AA BB, and here I can be AA BB. Okay. Here I can go. Interbreed, I get the offspring, perhaps, right? And, um, sorry, that, right? And now, this little B allele has never seen this little A allele. Okay? And it could be that the interaction prevents um, survival. So you could have, you know, little bee drifting. You know, you have absolutely neutral in this environment, you big A, big A environment. But in this environment, you fail to hear this. You're going to have sort of reproductive activation happen. So it's thought that a lot of speciation comes from this allopatry, and over time you get this incompatibility in various regions in the upper east end of the tree. And so <coughs> lack of speciation has been has been you know, having, having variations for a lot of years. And then now things can affect the rate of this, right? So if you have a faster rate of evolution, I can get this happening faster. If I have selection, selection can drive this really fast. So you can get this happening faster. Sea level rise. Okay. Okay. And now we have water separating the sea uh, yeah. or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So we have <laughs> water popping up. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. This picture is like in the Fantasia. That's true. It is a dead analogy. Um, I mean, how is we say, use that analogy a lot? Does it show that? It could be something that happens in there. You know, if I have you know, different distribution of seed sizes, so size and frequency of seeds, and the loss of those seeds. Right? And I could say that you know, it's best if you have different seeds for different you know, aspects. Because if you have one particular seed population, you know, they feed well, but not feed, so you can not have a species. And so we have models to say how you get to this sort of thing of appreciation. But you know, some also it can happen, some also say it can't happen. There are very few things that you can actually do that. But most of the time, you can do that in this way. Now, the question is whether the fiction in that can be used as well. So you could have certain appreciation that can be uh, extinctions.
So we can have, uh, when I'm studying, I have the species, and here I have the species, and here this this morphology, and here I have this morphology, and here I have this morphology. And these are all the same that I have. So I might be tempted to say, here is one species, here is one species. Right? So this species occurs at this time. So it looks like an extinction and speciation. And the question is about like how things we really matter about. So oftentimes we think about you know we talk about physics and that physics and all the physical situation. We if we start to go and get the mechanism in this, so what happens after that? So we have that identification for high education that we can do the same thing that we should be that rare one.
So if it turns that credit, what happens to that person? Right. So if the existing contract method means that you can't have the interval with that, uh, in essence, you'll pay that back. And there, if you have some sort of initial appreciation back, then maybe in the scenario that you know, live in Italy, you know, have a couple of shares in the market where you have to go out of the record where you can make it more simple. It could be that it's just Other questions about this? <coughs> okay, so there are other models too that can fit. Okay. So here are models where the diversification rate is a function of just new species. Or in that this is the A. That's right. What's the what's the class of model? Mr. Joe, right? And there's another model where it just depends on um, right? And so we have these sorts of models where the decision is about to change. Okay. Why may you want a model like this? So you can test models and see which one wins. Okay, it's like having ants fight. Right? Why do you want to do that? What are you trying to get at by doing this, doing that? Right, so there's going to only be one in terms of multi-model inference. But so what? Again, you know, it's important to know like why we're doing this stuff. So how does this model, this model, differ from our earlier exponential model? And so this is a model where you have only a certain number of species of the group. Okay. Might that be realistic? Is there a mixture of I mean, at a given location, I mean, how many oak species can you have in one place? Right? Many, but not, you know, crazy enough. And so, how many oak species can you have in the world? Well, again, there's a limit to that, probably. Right? You can, at, at most, you can have, you know, one, one species per tree. Right? That's the crazy two limit. Right. They sit next to each other and, you know. Right, so you could possibly have that, but that's going to be a smaller number than that, right? So there's some sort of upper limit. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are also weird because, for example, so, so in the case of warbler species, where they fit a model and find it, let's just go ahead. Okay. So 
North American warblings and look at models and find that the best model is closely to the country. And so in some ways, the mechanism is kind of weird, right? So I have a warbler in Maine, okay? And I speciate, oh, no, wait, there's a warbler in Mexico that's speciated. It's above K, I can't speciate, right? So how does that signal sort of get to Maine, right? So it's like that, unlike, you know, the number of individuals in the population, they might have a bad of broth, you know, got too many, it's not for all of us. So there's an issue. But yet, people find good data that these sort of models often work best or to have some sort of carrying capacity. Okay. Yeah. And again, though, then things sort of can break out of it, right? So um, we have wasps that parasitize aphids, and then we have wasps that parasitize wasps that parasitize aphids. And so once you figure out, oh, wasps are also made of meat, right? Now you have a whole other way of areas to diversify upon. So you can just escape it that way. Um, so yeah, so this might be some sort of weird scale dependent thing where like, some scales K works, other scales it doesn't. And so you need to understand. Okay? But this is telling us something about how nature works. Right? So is number of species based on, you know, what is it based on things that are ecological similar, ecologically similar to you? Based on the available number of niches, and what set this k value? Okay. We can also use methods to just estimate different rates of the parts of the tree. Okay. Um, <coughs> so here we see you know, different groups of organisms and we've estimated the circulation rates. And we'll find that you know, here are birds. Do birds go at a fast rate? No, actually, some birds go at a fast rate. And this is what I call this I'm not saying I have a prediction that perching birds are at a fast rate. I'm saying, I look for the path out there. So, it's like reading natural history, but of evolution. You know, so see what, how evolution patterns are across time. And they don't think it's just from that. Um, and here's another two classroom right there. Here's the precipitation rate, and here's the precipitation fraction. Okay? And these are conifer plots for activists. Okay? And so think of this as you know, a you know, topographical map. Okay? And I'm going to get the precise estimate of the peak. Right? This is something that can go down you know, two meters. Okay? I don't know if I know where it's in the two meters. In general, we have a hard time with the structure. Alright, so all that stuff is done without traits. They're just done looking at individual species and saying, uh, groups and saying, this group has a, this rate, this group has that rate. The rate changes at this point in time. Right? Um, but also, we think that traits affect this too. Right? We think that precise pollinia placement. Has a, a rate increase. Um, <coughs> you might think that being, you know, a specialist on, you know, T. Rex scales or T. Rex feathers actually probably um, might have been a bad idea post KT, right? And cause an increased extinction rate, right? So we had these questions about trait evolution too, and how trait and this diversification rate work together, okay? And so <coughs> here we have a tree. And have a picture of black and white states. So I said to you, you know, a week ago, tell me about the transition rate from black to white. What would you say? You know, from white to black. What is that? Oh, 
wrong despite reading the caption. Well, you could say, so, in the middle of the tree, you know, how many black and white changes do I have? How many red black changes do I have? How many lack of black and white? How many lack of white and black changes do I have? Right. And I see, you know, I might get white occasionally, but pretty often go back to black. I'm going to black and white. Right. Um, and so it suggests that there's, um, integration rate. There's enough case. Actually, the true model here is equal to this. So, what's going on here? Well, it's different speciation. And so, the black species has to be more. But if I were just doing what we did last week, I'd be going into it. That'd be great. That'd be normal. And right, okay, here's okay. Now I'm on now I'm on board with this. Okay, now look at this tree. Oops, yeah, we can definitely tell the black one is changing much more. Actually, nope. In this case, same range. And then I'm back to a case where I have differential conditions. Okay. So this is the theorem. So I say I have a lot of you know state one back next. Fortunately, it's not quite the same pattern. And so we don't have this identifiability issue. Okay? And so we can have a model where we have differential transition rates and different speciation and occlusion rates for different states. And jointly estimate the effect of both of them. So it could be you do a trick model where these rates are equal, and all the differences based on these rates. It could be a model where these are equal, and based on these rates, it could be a combined model. Okay. <coughs> so we can control for those biases, but also a happy side effect is now we can say what's the effect of zero on the speciation rate or net diversification rate, the effect of one on that. Right, so why would you care about that? Mm -hmm. no, it's called the key innovation game in your paper. But also it helps you understand the world, right? You can say, okay, why do we have so many you know, things that, like flowers that have symmetry. <laughs> like that. So, zygomorphic symmetry, right? Versus flowers that are like this. <laughs> Date is orchid daisy, right? So, yeah. So why might we have so many orchids? And so, well, we have a lot of daisies too, but... And why do we have lots of these and maybe fewer of those? Right, well, it could just be because it could be because we have a faster transition rate this way, or it could be that these are speciating faster. They're going extinct slower. Right, so now we can actually estimate that and figure out what's causing this. Okay. Um, do fish that have the ability to have their front and, front and rear jaws evolve separately, pharyngeal jaws evolve separately, diversify faster or not? Right. We actually test that. Um, <coughs> so let's just do this. Right. And so again, you know, if you estimate speciation rates, here I have, you know, the true value and you estimate the true value and you estimate it. You deal with five points. Right. So you can tell. So yes, is uncertainty, right? But they're distinguishable. Okay. But for extinction. Yeah. Right, so I'm going to try to estimate different extinction rates. 
Okay. And we also estimate rates of state change. Right? So they don't, you know, they often overlap, they some overlap to these different values. Okay, if the values are different, they just fall apart, they're more similar, the part falls apart. More taxa, but it's a Okay. <laughs> and so this is a, a series of models, so that basic model with this is known as BISI, okay. uh, binary state change, speciation, and extinction, BISI. And now we have ones that have more than two states, so we go from rather than 0 and 1 again, 0, 1, and 2. And that's called MUSI, multiple states. We have ones that deal with geographic data, GOC. We have ones that deal with continuous data, too. Okay. So you now do this joint estimation of trait evolution and discrete trait in, in um, diversification as well. Now we do this, of course, with, with such good comparisons. Right? This is a lot more powerful. This is actually rate estimates rather than just telling us 5 plus is 1 minus. Okay. And one thing you might have noticed is it's hard to get a complete tree. Right? Why is a complete tree useful for this? Right, so we have all the, all the information about the speciation extinction events from the branch lengths. Right? If I had that bias sampling such that I, you know, I really like orchids and fuck more orchids than daisies, that would affect my results, right? Because now I have to explain all these extra orchids. Okay, so bias sampling would be a big problem here. Um, and then sometimes you also have, I know that there are four species in this group, but I don't know what the phylogeny is in that group. Right, so now, you know, See mammal that was in this tree is, is now we have two parts in the day. Okay. <coughs> so here's an example, okay, coming back to your point. Um, here we have self compatible flowers, right? So that's the ability of outbreeding, and then self compatible, so they can feed themselves. So you say, okay, great. So these, you know, they're the only plant on an island, they're fine. These are on the island, they're extinct. Okay? These have to throw energy into attracting bees to come pollinate and stuff like that. The pollinators go off, the pollinators die away, they're dead. Bees are happy. Right? So, <coughs> I think, why do we have any of these anymore? Right? And so, what we can do is analyze both transition rates and the distribution rates. Okay? And so, we find that there's Injury going from incompatible to compatible, but not back. Okay. So there are various ways to become self incompatible. Right, we have genes where you recognize that oh, if, you, if, the, if the allele in the pollen matches the allele on the, the stigma, on the style, the pollen won't, won't grow. Okay. So if you lose that system, then you can grow with whenever. There are various ways to go this way. It's hard to go this way. It's just kind of like lose this way. Okay. That's a discovery we get from the methods. And again, just using stuff like the tips. Right, all you need to do is this pre-computed tree we got in our tip observations, and finding out something cool about directionality in this change. Right. We also need the net diversification rate. So here we have net rate of purple, here is net rate of stuff in category. And what do you see about this? Which rate's higher? The total rate is higher. In fact, the net rate for the, the self compatible one is negative. Okay. So they speciate and go extinct, but they then just go extinct fashion and speciate. So how do, I, how do I see any in that case? Then they're going to go extinct. Yet. So one thing is, you know, they, they keep getting new ones, and self compatible become self compatible. Right? And the other thing is, you might have just found new that haven't gotten meaning someone who wins against a casino in Vegas, right? Like, sure, you might think someone who has. Most people you find haven't, right? Um, at some point, that guy's going to be broken and lose all his money. But until that point, you know, his negative rate is still present. Okay? <coughs> so they tell us that despite the apparent 
abandoning itself compatible for long term is the self compatible have a much better diversification rate. Okay? Because it won't be due to the advantages of, of, of operating insects, right? You have more, more, more diversity, more variability, harder for them to adapt to each um, better able to adapt to, adapt to change and that sort of thing. Okay? And so, <coughs> Even though across life, or across lower life, you see a lot of self-compatibility. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, all these sort of things that break things into binary, like specialist, generalist, or self-compatible, self-incompatible, you always have to make this uncomfortable line drawn. Like, okay, how much you know, how much self do I need to have before I'm, you know, actually self compatible? And so what you, how can you deal with that in practice if you're worried about that? Um so right so what So yeah, so we do a sort of sensitivity test. So you could run this multiple times where I have to have a self-compatibility score of 8 to be self-compatible, and I have to grow 16, and at what level does it have to be before I start, stop seeing this pattern? And if it's crazy, then you say, okay, I don't, you know, yes, we can fight about this, but it doesn't matter. Right? Um, there's one way to deal with it. Another way is to argue you know, based on some basic idea of what you think it sh should be measured as. Right, so for example, we had a paper about um, does woodiness correlate with living where it freezes out, right? And what's a woody plant? Well, tree, woody, great. How about a cactus? Right. How about a palm tree? Right. So they don't have xylem, secondary xylem in the same way that a, you know, an oak tree does, but they you know, act woody, right? And so, this is a definition based on, you know, persistent above ground stem. It's a classic definition that people have used that sort of is based on sort of the ecological effects of being woody rather than the actual structural cause of being woody. So I can argue that. It would have been stronger if we had also done the sensitivity test, but, you know, recoding 40,000 species. It's easier to have a continuous trait that you just you know, apply a new, new, you know, new measure to and say, if less than x count as 0, if greater than x count as 1, vary x. Okay? So then they want to pick up one you get from today's lecture, <coughs> how to look at differential rates across a group, just ignoring trait change, and also how to look at the effect of traits on diversification, and this would be the joint effect of diversification and traits. Yes. Uh, actually, someone else repeat that. Right. And then also how to do just the participation without traits, just within plates. So ongoing questions in this area are sort of which models fit best based on you know, some biological processes. You know, what's the effect of mass extinctions on diversification rate? What's the effect of key innovations on diversification rate? Um, what's the effect of invasions of new species on diversification rate? You know, back, back in the fossil record. So you can ask questions like that using these approaches. Okay. Um, why do we see this lack of correlation between age and diversity? And what's causing that, that lack of correlation? Is it mean bias? Is it fact this logistic growth? Is it something like we've not really thought about yet? Explaining this. Why are there so many species in the trop in the tropics rather than temperate region? And that's this sort of question too. Um, it could be that ones in the temp tropic in the temperate region go extinct faster, things 
subsidize those profits, or can you just propose a much, much faster way um, to actually explain it so you can use the search engine for that? More questions about this? See you on Monday in the presentation.